Renaissance man, um, which says nothing about his age, age of course. How motivational he is. He does think about others and he thinks about, about the welfare of others and, and how can he help to make the world a better place. We all know is he has the, the blessing of the gift of the gab. One of my earliest memories is walking down Congress Street with Michael, I forget what the errand was, but walking down from Congress Square to Monument Square, and in that short space, I think he must have run into six or seven people that he knew, and I, I found that that was par for the course with Michael, and my wife and I uh, began to think of him as the Lord Mayor of Portland, because he, he just knew everybody and, uh, and was always glad to stop and, and talk to them. Uh, like he was running for office, you know, kissing hands and shaking babies. He needs to, to make sure that he maximizes everything. So he wasn't just a Boy Scout, he wasn't just an Eagle Scout. He found out that there were these palms that you could get that would go onto your Eagle badge. And that there were three of them, I believe, and he made sure that he had all three because nobody was going to get anything over on Mike. I love how gracious he is uh, and how kind he is and how generous in sharing himself and his work with, with everybody. We know Michael's a great researcher, uh, he's a great historian, great writer. I mean, he always did well in school and he um, was pretty smart, but I don't know if we would have said he was going to be a professor. No. The Portland Cayley Band, we do Cayleys for the Irish American Club. Uh, four to six times a year and have been doing that pretty much all along and Michael's been our piano player, he's a self-taught piano player and a uh, very good man with the rhythm and uh, been playing with him I think I must have played in at least several hundred if not a thousand and, or more Kaylees and contra dances and wakes and weddings and uh, just all sorts of things. He's even written a novel many people don't know about. Maybe I shouldn't divulge that secret. He's written a novel about a day in the life of Portland back around the turn of the century. Mike set up a scholarship fund um, several years ago now, probably six years ago. And the fund is in memory of our mom and our dad. And uh, Mike has funded this scholarship. It started out the first three years, there was one recipient, and for the last three years, there's been two recipients every year, and the scholarship um, is, is very generous and continues for each year that the student is in college um, if they maintain uh, a very reasonable grade point average. So um, it's a really nice thing, a very generous thing, and kind of a typical thing for Mike to do. He was the first. He got all the attention. Everything was all about Mike. And I think he kind of liked that. And when we came along, he tolerated us at best. I Barely. Guess. Yeah. And he tolerated some better than others. This is the only family um, photograph that we have, so we're really fortunate to have it. Yeah, this was how we saw ourselves uh, as a family. It's also how the neighbors saw the Connellys uh, down there. But, just not sure if it's the way Mike's are in the family. Definitely not the way Mike's are. So. Growing up in his late teens, early 20s, uh, we saw some pretty dramatic changes uh, go through. And, and again, that time, he graduated from high school in 69, at the height of the Vietnam War. Um, in 1970, our dad died. Uh, and I think that those two things really shaped Mike in a different way. Definitely became a bit more serious around that time. He also got uh, a heck of a lot easier to live with, and I think that was the beginning of the Mike that we see today. Right, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, aware of other things and other people and how 
people were treated, mm -hmm. um, things going on in the world. Yeah, neither of our parents finished no. high school, no. but they instilled in us the importance of, of education. Certainly he caught on to that. Mm -hmm. uh, he made a career out of being a student for, for a long time. Yeah. I, I remember uh, I had a, a week off in the summer a few years ago and didn't go anywhere, didn't go away. So I just popped in and I sat in on one of his classes and, and he captivated the audience with, with you know, brought everything back and, and listened to all their questions and answered all the questions. I mean, he's a great teacher. He told me that when he was uh, in school in Ireland, um, he uh, went out to visit the relatives in, in Ireland, in Connemara, and he was staying at the house, and they told the story about his father, who had um, gone into the town for the evening. And uh, on his way back from town, he, uh, he saw one of the neighbor's cows had become uh, detached from its tether and was walking along the road. So he, he brought the cow back uh, to the neighbor, and the neighbor, and the neighbor said, oh, it's not our cow at all. And, and so he didn't know where to go with the cow, so he brought the cow home. So um, much to the delight of uh, the parents. I don't know what happened to the cow or that part of the story, but the story continues because Mike was over visiting, and this is back in the days when, you know, there were lots of Europeans hitchhiking around Ireland, and um, there still are, I'm sure, but uh, Mike went into Galway, and um, I guess he went, he went off to a dance or something like this, and uh, he bumped into a couple of uh, Swedish girls who were uh, at the dance and they had their bicycles and they didn't have a place to stay so he took it upon himself to say well you'd, you'd be welcome to come out and stay at the relative's place without any trouble at all they'd be happy to have you so Mike shows up back at the house really quite late at night and uh, of course they have having tea at about 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning and, and uh, there's some snickering from the relatives as Mike comes in, in the door and sits with these two Swedish girls and and um, uh, Mike's relatives say, well, this is uh, quite an event. She's, you know, we told you the story about your father going into Galway and coming back and finding a cow and bringing a cow home. And you go into Galway and you come back and look what you've brought home. He has this wonderful trilogy of books, the John Ford book that he worked on with me, uh, City by the Sea, and of course they changed their skies. Probably every Portlander who is interested in history should have those three books, right? I'll put a plug in for those. But um, Michael made sure that uh, our manuscript was free of errors. And uh, I did, after getting to know him, I decided to gift him with a copy of one of my books. Uh, and uh, Michael got it, and, and uh, he must have looked at it the first night a little bit and being curious. And uh, he got back to me the next morning by email and he said, by the way, did you realize on page such and such, the word cavalry was misspelled? And I used that term several times in the book, but uh, on one, one, in one context I had misused it. Instead of referring to the horse troop, it was spelled referring to the, you know, the biblical reference. And uh, the only thing Michael said about the book that I'd given him is, uh, you know, um, you've, you've got a misspelling on page such and such, so uh, as, as Michael uh, also likes to relate, you know, my, my response to him at the time was, well, was there anything that you like, anything that you like about the book? And I really still haven't gotten an answer to that and to this day. I was having luncheon for four people from Belfast who were chaperones with the Irish children or former chaperones. And I invited our friend, Cata Concanon, who was 103 years old at the time. So we're sitting having lunch outside because Catherine couldn't go up the stairs. And she's eating, she loved to do. So Mike decided he was gonna be cute. And he said, when I first met Claire, for my tea, she gave me half and half. Then later on, she gave me milk for my tea. And guess what she's giving me now? And without stopping to eat with a mouthful of food, Catherine piped up and said, and I notice you're still hanging around her.
And one day we were at his house and we were having tea or lunch and talking and he said, aren't we the luckiest people in the world to have such wonderful heritage and such wonderful culture? And I had never really thought about myself or my culture uh, that way before. And, but, it, but when I think of it, it makes my heart uh, light and uh, it's, uh, it's a lovely sentiment to, to remember him by. Groups of us would have uh, music sessions and um, we would go from house to house and it would be usually a potluck affair and um, and Mike would show up and just basically eat everything on the table and people were uh, given the message to Mike that you might want to think about bringing something so uh, another Sunday comes around with a music session and um, the food comes out on the table and it's a bit late, as Mike usually shows up a bit late. And um, he comes in with, uh, and he's got, um, he's got some, a, pot, a big bag of food it looks like. He comes in and he takes out his bag, opens this box and takes this box out and it's from Dunkin Donuts. <laughs> and, uh, and he opens it up and it's donut holes. <laughs> From Dunkin' Donuts, and not only are they Dunkin' Donut donut holes, they're day old. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a great deal on them. <laughs> Hill. He was giving me a tour one time on Munjoy Hill and showing me a few things, and not just the John Ford sites. And uh, we actually wound up taking shortcuts through people's kitchens. He would just knock on the door and immediately chat with someone and then we'd sort of walk through the kitchen to chat with the family and Michael knew everybody in the family and then we'd move on to the next house. So it was the first time I'd been around Munjoy Hill where we walked through some of the houses unexpectedly. Years ago, he and I went to Ireland together and he went his way. We were there for six weeks, saw him a few times, then on our way back, my sister and her husband drove us to Shannon. Uh, we checked in and then went out to visit with my family and a mutual friend from Belfast. So everybody was having a good time talking. I checked my watch and decided, well, I think it's time we go to the plane. So Michael goes, huh, can't you tell somebody who doesn't travel very much? She's anxious. So I thought about it, I figured I won't say anything, but to myself I said, Chuck him along, I'll get you later, and which means my day will come. So they chatted for a little while longer, and I started to say it again, and over the loudspeaker came this voice with the last two passengers for Boston. Please come, you're holding the plane up. So we rushed on. We get on the plane, everybody is glaring at us because they had been waiting for 10 minutes. When we got to our seat, Mike makes the announcement. He said, oh, my poor old mother, she's not feeling well. Everybody started apologizing for being nasty or whatever. Not one person asked me how I felt, and I had an answer, which was, I'm feeling fine. He's being an Amadon, as usual. Peter and I, are, his brother Peter, are watching football, and we invite our two brothers over. My brother Marty, his, and Mike, Peter Crumley, who I'm hanging out with a lot. And, uh, so we invite my brother Marty and Michael over to watch football on a Sunday, living up on Spring Street. Peter was living there. So they're playing trivia pursuit, watching football, and you know, having a few laughs. And uh, so at the time, uh, Peter's wife had made a couple of pies, and so we broke, you know, it was halftime, said, hey, it's time for pie. And so she happened to make a chocolate cream pie and a pumpkin pie. And so uh, it just so worked out that Peter and I had the chocolate cream pie, and my brother, Marty, and Michael, finally Michael, had the uh, pumpkin pie. So we ate, drank coffee, and I think we may have played a little more trivia pursuit. Then, as it went, both my brother, his, Peter's brother, Michael, left. So, of course, in a very short time, it was time for more pie, of course, right? And so we decided we'll try the pumpkin pie. 
So me and Peter both grab it, take a piece out, get a coffee, and then we both take a bite and we spit it out immediately and start screaming. Like that's, what is wrong with this? And so what we found out was when Pam came on, she forgot to add sugar to a pumpkin pie. But there's some pies you can add, no, as you, so my brother and Michael ate that pie. So we saw them a week later and we asked them, said, hey, how was that pumpkin pie? And they both said, yeah, it was very good. Yeah, it was delicious. So I'm not exactly what that no. says about Michael, uh, and he'll, that he'll eat anything, or that he's just too damn polite for his own good. He loves my scones. I make, I make, you know, the original and authentic scones, and sometimes brown bread, uh, which uh, is a staple uh, in, in Panamera, where I come from. And um, of course, I make some uh, extra for anybody that comes. Uh, that is of Irish heritage, if they'd like to take home their little doggy bags for breakfast the next day. Uh, one time we were doing a gig together, a wedding, and actually it was in Kenny Bunkport in a really fancy place right down on the water. And uh, there were a bunch of us, and we all arrived, and uh, um, I think we played the preview in the service, and then we came and we were playing uh, a little bit of a cocktail hour before the wedding. And um, we, a bunch of us set up. Play. And Mike was in the band, he was playing guitar, backup guitar in the band. And we're getting in the play, and people are getting anxious, they want some music, you know. And we're about to start playing, and Mike's not around. We can't find him anymore. And um, so we start playing the first tune, and I'm playing away. And all of a sudden, I look over my left shoulder, and there's Mike standing there with an 18-inch diameter plate full of deviled eggs. <laughs> and he's eating deviled eggs, passing deviled eggs around. He stole the friggin' platter off the buffet table. And this is a classy event, too. I mean, we're lucky we didn't get thrown out of <laughs> it. If it's free, <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Many times I've seen these uh, superb presentations by Michael, but he'll take time before the presentation to thank people for being there, and not just to do that, but sometimes to thank people individually. And uh, I hadn't really seen that done to such a degree before, and, 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 and sometimes Michael, he made everybody feel at home, but sometimes he would thank people individually, and almost the entire audience, so that by the time he was finished, there was no time left whatsoever for the presentation. So luckily we gave him a little bit of extra time and heard that. We actually had a, uh, have a picture of him actually reaching into his wallet, paying for lunch. Uh, this is a fact that uh, both Becky and I can swear to, and I actually have photographic evidence that he actually did pay for lunch. Of course, it was after we got him a honorarium <laughs> of $100. He bought us sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> Small sandwiches, too. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Just amazing. <laughs>
pinan ni Neren, kung na portfolio ng kasi may nilig, agus kung yung 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 Center on the Hustlet of this and another project that I was still testing my neural net on the way I'm going to do the most on the way I'm going to do the most on the way I'm going to do the most in the Irish tradition one has to pray when Congratulations. Uh, that's toward off um, bad luck or jealousy or pride. Uh, and uh, so the um, blessing actually uh, literally says, uh, you are shaped by God. And um, all of us at the Irish Heritage Center are just so proud of your work uh, that you have done uh, with uh, grace uh, and lived your life with grace and uh, the heritage. that you have left all of us uh, of our heritage here in Portland and uh, we thank you we just love you and uh, uh, we are blessings I know I speak for Gary we couldn't be prouder than to have my true brother as an example for us well Michael uh, I mean, there, there's nothing that I say to your face that I wouldn't repeat behind your back but uh I wish you well, and congratulations on this award. It's, it's well deserved, be, des despite your, uh, your, your impediments. Um, congratulations on the long life. Want to say, Co Arches, Agus Pinari, Basically, you, uh, you listen to what he has to say, and if you can get a word in edgewise, you're doing well. I, I moved his damn piano twice, and there will be no third time. I know, I, I say all the time that the world could use a Soldier song from Mike to keep soldiering on to.